Oh, I guess I don't need this, right? Oh, dang it. You know who you are. It's hung on me. This is awkward, right? Way to start out. <laughs> <laughs> we can only go up from here. Um, so my name is Deanna Turner. I'm actually one of two clinical pharmacists in the emergency department here in San Antonio at um, Methodist Hospital. And I feel like Tad and Mies kind of made my job easy. I should just say, take what they said and apply it to tramadol, and then I can just exit off the stage. <laughs> but I don't think I get off the hook that easy. And I have cute, dirty puppies. So we're going to go ahead, and this afternoon, we are going to dig up our own dirt on tramadol and uncover why we should probably call it tramadont. And I don't have anything to disclose. So tramadol, born in Germany, 1962. After FDA approval in 95, it made its way over to the US. That's how long we've been using it. 2014, the um, DEA reclassified it, and it's now a Scheduled IV controlled substance. To give you an idea of how much tramadol we use, in 2017, approximately 41 million prescriptions for tramadol were dispensed in the US. And what kind of pharmacist would I be if I didn't share Nerdy Dirt with you today? And isn't he cute? Um, when you look up tramadol, it's classified as an opioid analgesic. So that's pretty straightforward, right? Did you know that it actually has a dual mechanism of action and some unpredictable kinetics? And I will explain. If you look at tramadol, the parent compound, not an opioid does not bind to the mu opioid receptors. It has such a low affinity, doesn't bind, no opioid analgesic effects. Tramadol, though, is a prodrug like codeine, and it requires conversion to an active metabolite to achieve the analgesic effects. So it undergoes extensive first-pass metabolism in the liver by cytochrome P2D6. That enzyme will then take and metabolize it to the active metabolite, the primary active metabolite, M1. This is your opioid. This is what binds to the mu opioid receptor with a much higher affinity than tramadol, producing your analgesic effects. So then you're wondering, well, what does the parent compound even do? Tramadol, the parent compound, is an SNRI. So by inhibiting serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake, it potentially enhances the inhibitory effects of pain transmission. So it, too, could potentially contribute to the overall analgesic effects. Oh, poo. Sorry. OK, there we go. So dual mechanism of action claim, this is where it comes from. Your parent compound to a certain extent, but most importantly, that M1 metabolite, they combine to give you your analgesic effects of tramadol. About 80% of tramadol is metabolized by the CYP2D6 enzyme. And this is where things break down and get really dirty with tramadol. And we heard it before, so I'll just kind of drive home the point. CYP2D6, highly polymorphic. Activity varies greatly amongst individuals and ethnic groups. Activity can also be um, further described based on the metabolizer status. So someone who is extensive or intermediate metabolizers, the most common activity. This is your normal metabolizers. Someone who is a poor metabolizer, though, they have little to no CYP2D6 activity. So they essentially can't take tramadol and make the M1 metabolite, so when we give it to them, they get no pain control, no analgesic effects. What they do get, though, is exposure to the higher parent compound and SNRI effects, and also potentially serotonergic side effects. Opposite end of the spectrum are your ultra-metabolizers. They have multiple functional copies of the CYP2D6 gene. These patients are much um, more sensitive to tramadol, and they can take a normal dose that a normal metabolizer would just produce the normal levels. They can produce significantly higher concentrations of this M1 metabolite. And you guessed it, it can put them at risk for over-sedation, respiratory depression, and even death, sometimes unintentional. And precisely that's the exact reasons that were discussed earlier as to why it's contraindicated in our pediatric populations. So if we recap this variable CYP2D6 activity and unpredictable metabolism with tramadol, when we prescribe it, are we giving them an SNRI or are we giving them an opioid? We don't know. I could probably stop there, and that would be enough to give you pause the next time you think about prescribing tramadol, but there's a little more dirt associated with tramadol. 
And a, a common misconception with it is that it's a weak opioid. So it's got to have a much more favorable si um, side effect profile. It's got to be safer. And that's just not true. Drug interactions, numerous drug interactions. Tramadol is not the only drug that has drug interactions, but it potentially has significant drug interactions. And when we combine tramadol with other agents that also inhibit serotonin reuptake or inhibit the CYP2D6 pathway, then we've now taken them um, and exposed them to increased risk of serotonergic side effects that I mentioned earlier, like serotonin syndrome, which has been reported with therapeutic doses of tramadol when we combine them with common agents like our SSRIs, paroxetine, fluoxetine, bupropion is one, on Dancentron. Polypharmacy is a, it's a big problem, and most of our patients are probably taking one or more of these few examples I just gave you. The list goes on and on. We also, when we combine tramadol with these agents, we increase the risk for treatment failure. Just like I said, we are gonna take them if they're a normal metabolizer, essentially turn them into a poor metabolizer, no analgesic effects. Other serotonergic agents like venlafaxine, citalopram, they've been associated with hypoglycemia. Tramadol, SNRI, makes sense. And hypoglycemia has been associated with tramadol use. Um, there's been numerous case reports, case series, observational studies that show increased risk of um, hospitalization for hypoglycemia with tramadol use within the first 30 days of a prescription. And even our hospitalized patients, there's been increased risk of hypoglycemic events just by giving them tramadol when they're in the hospital. In a very compelling case report a few years back by Go Lightly and colleagues, very compelling type one um, case of a type one diabetic. She was an elderly patient. She experienced severe hypoglycemia after her first dose. She experienced rebound hypoglycemia after her second dose. And no other reports were, um, um, of hypoglycemia were reported in the case report after she stopped. She only had two doses and they took her off of it. Um, while the overall risk seems low per se, I think it's more underreported or we just don't make the association when we, these patients come in and we treat them. Either way, it is a serious, potentially life-threatening risk, so just keep it in mind. We shouldn't give tramadol to someone who has a past medical history of seizures. It lowers the seizure threshold. But we also have to keep new onset seizures on our radar when these patients come in. And there's, um, there was one good case series that evaluated um, new onset seizures and associated tramadol with 8% of new cases. And when you step back and you look at it further, most of these patients were only taking 100 milligrams a day or less of tramadol when they had their seizure. And no other um, reports of seizures in these patients at follow-up were reported when they stopped tramadol. So just keep that in mind. Risk does seem higher with an overdose when we combine tramadol with other serotonergic agents or with other agents that also lower the seizure threshold. And lastly, we also kind of need to toss this mindset that tramadol is a weak opioid, so it's gonna have less risk of um, dependence. That's just not true. And we're seeing more and more studies coming out showing that tramadol probably has a higher addiction potential than our other opioids, something that we weren't expecting and even increased risk for chronic opioid use after tramadol prescriptions. And withdrawal happens. In chronic use, abrupt cessation, they're gonna withdraw. They're gonna have the normal opioid withdrawal symptoms that we know, and one in eight will also have the SNRI side effect, I mean, withdrawal symptoms, like hallucinations, confusion, panic attacks. So we have unpredictable metabolism of tramadol, due to variable CYP2D6 activity. We have no way of knowing what random mix of an SNRI or opioid activity our patient will experience when we prescribe tramadol. Significant um, drug interactions exist with this drug. It should not be considered a safer alternative to opioids. We haven't even discussed, we don't have enough time to even consider what renal or hepatic dysfunction and the role that that can play in increasing and worsening all of these side effects, and especially when we forget to dose adjust for that when we prescribe it. Tramadol has a lot of dirt associated with it, so the next time you think about prescribing it, there's a lot to consider. So proceed with extreme caution, or maybe just tramadont. Thank you.